All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, this is our series, um, our guest speaker series on protection strategy. So we're just about to get started. Um, before that, we just want to um, double check everybody that's online um, understands how the audio um, and questions work. Great. So you guys are all muted at the moment. Um, but feel free to add in comments or questions into the question and answer box, and we can bring those up to Caroline and Jessica as we go through. Okay. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm Jessica Lenz. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Protection here at Interaction, and I lead on the Results-Based Protection Program um, and have been working on this for the last almost three years. Um, and so we're really excited to have everybody here and participating with us um, to explore um, what protection strategies have been all about and how this links to a results-based approach to protection. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about who our guest speaker is in just a minute, but I wanted to give a bit of a background on our objectives and why we've been doing this um, and what we expect to um, achieve by the end. Um, basically since for the last through well actually for the last month or so month and a half um, we've been carrying out a series of interviews um, and speaking with a number of different people and doing desk reviews um, to understand um, different aspects of protection strategies um, so we have two core objectives that we're looking at and one is really to review whether current approaches to protection strategies support a results-based approach to protection and then to identify those critical components within the strategy itself that will support um, the approach to a results-based approach to protection. Um, so both a review and then to really identify and, and hone in on those components. We expect um, at the end of the, the series of the desk review and the interviews in this um, uh, speaker series to put out a summary and analysis paper um, that will compile all of the key issues that we've identified, the barriers, the obstacles, the challenges, but as well as um, thinking through how to move forward um, and some of the um, recommendations around what are those critical components and what do we need um, to do in order to ensure that protection strategies are results based. Um, and second, um, we are planning our next in-country roundtable in August. Um, and so the findings and the work around the um, protection strategies right now um, will help us take this to the field and be able to validate and, and see how practically um, we can apply this um, at the field level. And so this will be in August. So just so some background for those of you that have not been participating since the very beginning, um, we started off our um, guest speaker series speaking to a, a couple of different individuals um, from different parts of the world. Um, I started it off, um, I don't even remember the date now. May 18th. May 18th um, with some preliminary findings from the interviews that we did con conduct um, and that um, recording is available, so if you um, have not listened to it, um, please make sure you, you listen to that as some background and a foundation for the, the speaker series. Um, and then last week, we were able to speak with um, a colleague from Nonviolence Peace Force in South Sudan who really spoke to us about protection strategies and, and building from the ground up and really looking at it um, from that level versus something that was top down. Um, earlier this week on Tuesday, we spoke to a colleague who was the uh, former GBV and protection sector advisor and subcluster coordinator in the Central African Republic. Um, and she was able to really um, engage us and talk to us about protection strategies, um, looking at it through um, the lens of GBV. And today, um, and I'll introduce our guest um, in more detail in just a minute, but we'll be speaking with a colleague uh, who's a protection and a GBV specialist from the Danish Refugee Council in Lebanon. Um, and then next week, um, we will um, end our, our guest speaker series with Louise Oban, who's the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. Um, and she will come in on Thursday of next week um, to help us kind of wrap up and reflect on um, the key findings and the discussions that have been going on over the last four weeks um, and help us to think um, 
going forward, what do we do next? So just to give us some definitional background and an understanding so we're all on the same page, uh, I just wanted to go over what is results-based protection and, and what this is about and how this is framing our discussion. Um, so results-based protection refers to results as the measurable components of an intervention that contribute to and include the outcome or impact, intended or unintended, positive or negative, of the response. So outcome is measured in terms of reduced risk. And then since we're talking about protection strategy, I also wanted to at least start off by saying what where our starting point was when we started to look at protection strategy. So this refers to a combination of efforts, often involving multiple actors and sectors, to bring about a desired protection outcome. A strategy is larger than a program. It should inform and be informed by a comprehensive set of efforts working towards a common desired outcome. <clears throat> And then what is a strategic planning, what is strategic planning for protection? So this is the process of articulating the desired protection outcome or outcomes, articulating the pathway or causal logic to achieve it, setting out clearly defined corresponding objectives and indicators, and describing the complementary roles of actors and contributing to the desired outcome. So to get us started then, um, let's, uh, let us introduce our, um, our speaker today, who is Caroline Mas Maspongi. Did I get it right, Caroline? Maspongi. <laughs> you got <Hopefully>. it right. <laughs> <laughs> I have messed up everybody's name during this entire speaker series, and I apologize. Um, everyone had difficult names. But um, we really are excited to have Caroline here with us today. Um, she has been working in the field of protection and human rights for the past eight years, um, mostly in Central and East Africa, and, and, and currently now is in Lebanon. Um, for the past five years, um, she has been working in the field of gender-based violence with um, international NGOs such as IRC and DRC, and she's and we, we actually had an opportunity to meet with Caroline um, in March um, and to speak with her a little bit further about results-based protection when, when we did a field visit to Lebanon, um, looking at program design particularly and exploring theories of change. Um, and so Caroline was able to engage with us on that um, with many other colleagues in Lebanon through a practitioner's roundtable in March. Um, so a, a lot of her work um, has been exposed to results-based protection more recently as well. And she currently is the protection coordinator and GBV, GBV specialist in Lebanon for DRC, um, where she is both working internally on um, and through interagency um, on protection strategies um, as part of um, both protection and GBV sectors. So welcome, Caroline. We're excited to have you here. Um, and so just like our other um, series, um, we'll, I'll ask us several questions um, to Caroline, and then at the end we'll be able to open it up to questions for our, our guests online. So just to get us started, um, just to kind of give a little bit of a background so those that know, um, over the last couple of speakers that we've um, been talking to, we've focused a lot on developing the process of developing a strategy, including coordination and leadership and building from the ground up. Um, and this past Tuesday, we also looked specifically at the subgroups, so like GBV or child protection, and how those feed into an overall protection strategy. I'm hoping with our conversation today with Caroline, we'll kind of shift this a little bit and focus a lot on the substance um, within a protection strategy and what that what should be there so rather than focusing so much on the process a little bit more on the content um, and so just to kind of start us and, and really what we're hoping to do with this series too is is to really um, think about um, forward thinking versus focusing in on the challenges um, and the problems. We do that quite a lot. So we do hope that we can have some interesting ideas and recommendations that come from this. 
So I'm wondering, Caroline, can you share then some of your experience maybe with us on what you've experienced in terms of current interagency protection strategies, what they look like in terms of reducing risk such as violence or coercion, exploitation, and deliberate deprivation? Sure. Um, thanks, Jessica. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to speak um, about result-based protection, uh, especially after your visit in, in Lebanon that uh, gave me food for thoughts. Um, so yeah, regarding the, the development of, um, of protection strategies in terms of, of content and how much they address risks, um, I can speak about my experience in Lebanon uh, when we, we developed as part of the interagency the Lebanese Crisis Response Plan, which was the, the let's say, interagency and sector plan for 2016 and 2015. And especially as part of the SGBV task force, we had um, initial discussion looking at threats, vulnerabilities, and capacities uh, with the main stakeholders that were involved in the GVV task force, and especially linked to the Syrian crisis and how it affects women and girls. Um, the conclusion was clearly that uh, we are in a non-CAM setting with limited access to services uh, due to several reasons, including restriction on legal stay of, of Syrian refugees, but also patriarchal society that gives limited access to uh, and mobility of women and girls. And uh, in addition to feeling um, of uh, lack of safety from women and girls, and uh, in parallel, overcrowding and lack of privacy in, in, in Syrian refugee settlements. So this was more or less, let's say in brief, uh, the outcome of our discussion on the analysis, which are things that we already knew, that we already documented and talked about as part of the task force. Uh, so we took some time to talk about that, but then shifted on to focusing on what strategy we wanted to put in place in order to, um, to address these issues. And there we articulated the strategy around uh, three main pillars, prevention, response, and then system strengthening or capacity building. Uh, so in terms of prevention, we, we looked at uh, ensuring that there was an ongoing risk identification and mitigation through uh, safety audits and development of safety planning through a community-based approach. And in terms of response, of course, ensuring that all the specialized services were in place, but also that we had an increased access to communities through mobile teams. And that was especially in the light of uh, increased uh, restrictions on accessing legal stay for Syrian refugees that uh, give them limited access to, to, to these services, so increasing outreach. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of system strengthening, um, we, we looked at uh, capacity building, ensuring that governmental authorities were engaged and involved in the response. And this was more or less the articulation of, uh, of our sector plan and how we, how we ensured or how we wanted to make sure that it really addressed the reduction of risks for women and girls when it comes to GBV especially. Um, I think definitely our, our sector plan was more output focused than, than outcome focused, uh, mostly because we, we were we faced some cha some challenges in, in developing or defining these outcomes and seeing the bigger picture is let's say easy on when we talk but when we have to come down to measuring it and capturing it and defining it especially as the interagency process in a limited time uh, it can be quite challenging so we added in few um, outcomes and indicators related to these outcomes but these were less relevant, let's say, than the outputs that we had um, drafted from ourselves. And then the outputs were obviously reflecting more what actors were already doing or planning to do, uh, rather than to start from scratch on like what is the most relevant thing to do, although most of the time we realized that it was matching anyway. But the, what I'm trying to say is that the reflection started from, okay, what are we doing now? What is working? What can we build on? Rather than what are the problems and how do we address them and then how do we develop the strategy accordingly. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it, that's what we've often found with, I think, a lot of um, our interviews um, in terms of how protection strategies are developed. It, it does often start with what actors are already doing rather than really trying to understand the particular problems. But I do think it's interesting that you, you've brought in that your the plan was trying to look at prevention um, services, so a response, as well as environmental building. Um, 
even if it was output focus rather than outcome. Um, but I, I guess I want to build on that a little bit. Um, and I, I know I said we wanted to focus, focus on substance and not too much on process, but it does seem that the seems like that the process actually does influence what ends up in the protection strategy, um, particularly how the methodology um, is used and, and what that looks like. So. I'm wondering then from an organizational level, could you share with us what the process might have looked like for DRC in Lebanon? Um, and are there specific steps in terms of staffing, timing, facilitation, methodology, or resources, or any other issues um, that you feel help to strengthen the protection strategy development compared to what might happen at an interagency level? Um, so maybe looking at DRC particularly, um, and whether there's some learning there that that could that we could apply to interagency um, work, um, and, and looking at the process in terms of uh, I hopefully um, having a stronger um, protection strategy with with substance. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Um, so in DRC across our operations, we have um, standard processes where we have annual reviews of our strategy uh, and we'll redraft basically the strategy for the next year across the sector. So this is not specifically uh, specific to the protection sector. And then we have six months in the implementation of the strategy, we have a workshop. Uh, so mid-year review basically where we look at assessing the implementation of the strategy and revising it according to our findings. Um, in addition in Lebanon, so in addition to this process that we had uh, conducted, we also held uh, in 2014 and we're doing it every year, uh, a three-day workshop looking at protection strategy specifically. Um, so basically, we had a three-day workshop uh, in Beirut involving uh, all the protection managers and uh, key field uh, staff, like key officers, etc., uh, as well as the head of office and the uh, senior management team for part of the process, especially when decisions has, had to be, to be made, um, and of course, uh, mainstreaming each for mainstreaming purposes, etc. Uh, myself and our um, child protection coordinators were supporting the process, but the facilitation was actually done by our deputy head of program. Uh, and we found it more relevant due to his neutrality in the process and how he could understand um, the different, um, let's say, uh, opinion in the room or um, priorities that were fleshed out of the discussion. Um, so we conducted a SWOT analysis, um, we're looking at our ongoing assessments like protection monitoring but other, other assessments and then we came up with an action plan based on the main, um, main direction of the strategy that we had agreed upon. Then we produced a thorough document uh, that outlined this process and uh, main uh, findings in terms of problems, concerns uh, that we had identified and how we addressed them. Uh, and that strategy is for a year long, um, so it should be revised, of course, regularly, but it should be every year. Uh, once we endorsed the strategy, uh, I basically supported each field office, so each protection manager and their field colleagues, to develop a contextualized action plan based on this strategy. Uh, and then, of course, we made sure that the strategy fit the organization, uh, the organizational strategy, and ensure that we mainstream protection across uh, across the, the the sector strategy. Um, so this is in brief um, the outline of our process. Um, yeah, Maybe to speak about. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, these are really good um, steps. I'm wondering whether or not you feel like, you know, you, you talked about the deputy head being neutral. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even having a three day workshop, going through SWOT analysis, particular exercises. Um, and many of our interviews indicated that this often doesn't happen in the interagency world. Um, you don't have the time or there isn't that neutral coordinator sometimes um, who's wearing a couple of hats. So I'm wondering, can those be applied to. Um, an interagency level to develop a protection strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I have um, asked myself that. Um, and I think that definitely having a neutral yet experienced, knowledgeable uh, interagency body that leads this process um, is really important. And for us, it, it was really helpful to have him leading the process. Um, so I think that's one thing that we could build on, uh, that is sometimes the case, sometimes not. Um, and then I think one limitation 
of the interagency strategy that I could think of if I if I related to what we did for DRC Lebanon is that we are aware of our funding, we are aware of our grant situation, we are aware of our capacity internally, externally, the priorities that we are already uh, addressing or that we are ready to address. So for example, the need of uh, health uh, service provision came up, but it was clear for us that as DRC in Lebanon, we're not going to do health. So this was priorities that were preset, if you want, when we discussed. So that made the discussion and the development of the strategy much easier and based on a common understanding of what we want, what we don't want, and what we do and what we don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, as interagency, often we have uh, an understanding, a more or less understanding of what do, who does what. Like we have um, three W's, we have service mapping, etc. But how much do we know about our intentions, about our priorities, about our funding um, uh, availability, and um, yeah. So this is this is something that is sometimes more challenging as part, as part of the interagency. But I felt that definitely the particip I'm going to say something obvious, but the participatory approach is, was definitely the right way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and one finding is that taking ownership of the strategy takes time, mm -hmm. but it's really of paramount importance if you want to, to have a successful implementation. So it's not just developing the strategy, but even after the development of the strategy, it took us months uh, to make it contextualized to the field level, to make sure that the managers, the, the, the field staff owned it, understood it, could explain it, uh, knew how to, uh, how to implement it uh, on their, in their everyday work. So this is something that takes time. As part of the interagency, sometimes it's a process that is too quick mm -hmm. and that doesn't result in, an, in, a, in really an ownership of the response. And I think we could look at ways to make it more participatory and with more participatory means of, of course, more uh, lengthy in terms of time. Yeah, and, and I know I know the first question out of people's mouths will oftentimes be, well, this is an emergency. We, we often don't have the time. Um, so how would you balance that, <laughs> trying to be participatory um, given the time constraints everyone has in the emergency? Do you feel like there is still a possibility to be reflective um, and, and give the, the devoted time needed despite the urgency that everybody feels? Um, I think if I build on the experience as part of the sector plan uh, um, for GBV um, in, in Lebanon when we developed the, the Lebanese crisis response plan, um, the fact that we had room, so we had a, a workshop basically, I think four or five hours, and we had room to discuss um, the analysis already. And we all agreed on what the problems were and how to address them was quite obvious because we had this previous engagement with each other as part of the task force where we were discussing these issues and these approaches regularly. Mm -hmm. So when we came down to, to really developing the strategy, there was this previous work that has been done before that could lead us to say, yes, this is the right way to go. Um, so I feel that having this preparatory work, even in emergency, where you already know the people you work with because you have regular meetings with them, um, through the, the cluster meetings, through bilateral meetings, etc., and you know what works, you know what doesn't work, you have documented it throughout the process. So when you have to develop your strategy, you, it's kind of obvious what you already mm -hmm. have to do, and the ownership comes with that as well, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so maybe a little bit, talking a little bit then, um, going back to some of the substance, where we get that, we know that for results-based protection, we, there's an emphasis um, on the need for a robust protection analysis in order to shape the response. So without that analysis, um, we oftentimes do just end up um, putting in a strategy our, our key activities. Um, so this is, you know, having that analysis is a critical piece um, for the development of a protection strategy. From your perspective, what should that analysis look like in order to help decide actions to actually address threats and vulnerabilities and capacities? And perhaps do you have any examples from an organizational level of what that um, might look like that you could you could, you could share with us? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Um, so. I think for me, a, a protection analysis should be evidence-based, which means it has to be really 
grounded in, in facts, not perception. So it should really be based on, um, on issues, trends, behaviors uh, that we had you have, we have documented, we have observed, and it's just not just uh, sitting around the table and say, I think that the problem is that due to this and that. It's really based on something that we have observed that we can articulate uh, based on on based on on actual uh, on actual facts, basically that we're seeing um, on the field. Um, then the a good protection analysis should be able to take uh, stock of changes. So what was valid, and especially when it comes to Lebanon, this is something that we're seeing a lot. What was valid um, six months to a year ago is absolutely not right uh, today. So we have to be able to say, well, this was like that six months ago, but today it changed. And not to uh, take the document that we had developed six months ago and, and put it back on the table and readapting it. Um, and then I think it also has to take uh, to take stock of, uh, of course, the be best practices in data collection and analysis, especially when it comes to GBV. I know that uh, Kate already mentioned it, uh, but basically ensuring uh, confidentiality and ensuring uh, proper data protection, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, GBV incidents and, and survivors, etc. Um, for DRC Lebanon, I think our analysis is grounded in our ongoing data collection. So, of course, we have occasional assessments. Uh, like recently, we had we had an assessment on our community-based approach that allowed us to flesh out a lot of um, issues that we're seeing at the field level, risks, vulnerabilities, etc. But our analysis is mostly. Um, um, it's, not, it's mostly based on the findings from our protection monitoring and our safety audits um, that we ensure to to uh, to make it action oriented, so that what we're seeing on the ground results in actual uh, informing our strategy, informing our program, etc. Um, so maybe just to mention a few challenges that I think uh, we touched upon a little bit about developing protection analysis. Um, I mentioned uh, good practices in data collection and analysis, and that's something that seems obvious, but it's really uh, challenging, I think, when it comes to GBV or not. Um, we have very limited uh, guidance uh, when it comes to um, protection data collection analysis. When it comes to data analysis, we're facing in Lebanon for us, at least in DRC, uh, a lot of challenges in analysis. It's easy to collect information, much less so to analyze it and analyze it uh, in a systematic way um, and not only quantitatively but also qualitatively. And that's something that takes resources, that takes time, um, etc. So I think that's something to take into account. And then, of course, the feasibility, as you mentioned, of doing it in a humanitarian context when things keep evolving, when we don't have much resources, when we're not necessarily willing to sit around the table for a lengthy workshop to reflect back on um, what's happening and, and how we're doing it and why, etc. Um, and then validated resources and methodology. Um, so what, um, how do we develop an evidence-based uh, analysis, uh, protection analysis? As I said, like, how can we make sure that when we sit around the table, we don't talk just about our own perception, but what, on what is actually happening at the field level, and so having guidance on how to do that. Um, so maybe, yeah, so maybe just to, to say that I think protection analysis is, of course, a cornerstone to developing a, a a proper strategy, uh, but it shouldn't be um, like a systematic process that is taking place because we have to do it, um, but it should be following a clear methodology that is realistic to implement in a humanitarian context. So if we're doing it, we know why we're doing it and, and how to do it properly. Otherwise, I think it's just reutilizing something that we have already said and already done. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and so some of our um, participants are aware we, in July, we're actually going to be exploring a little bit further um, information management and the, this whole issue of data collection and, and, you know, and the data that you're supposed to be using um, to 
in your protection analysis um, in order to inform your strategy. So we're, we'll, we'll be exploring that a little bit further, but I think these are really important pieces as we think about strategy and, and how you've raised them, um, and particularly because we, we end up do collecting a lot of information and, and we don't use it. Um, and so it, it becomes sometimes a tedious routine, but it, it's not um, strategic in any sense. Um, so I kind of want to build on that a little bit too, because the, the way we end up doing our strategies um, also depends on you know how we prioritize the issues that we're focused on. And sometimes that data can, can play into that or our assumptions can play into that. Um, and what we have found is that the priorities, just like you know, strategies in general in terms of the content, um, seem to focus again on just what everybody's doing or where funding is or an agency's mandate, but again are not based on reality oftentimes. Um, as you know, we were, you know, we engaged with Caroline and, and several other agencies in Lebanon in March to really look through um, program design and, and how that's connected to a theory of change. Um, and following our workshop, um, many of the organizations within the GBV sub-working sub group in Lebanon decided to take on um, a, a small little exercise to think through um, engaging with men and boys, um, but using a theory of change around that. Um, and I'm just wondering whether or not, Caroline, you could speak to um, that exercise um, and just and, and even the practitioners roundtable that you work that you participated in March in Lebanon, which was the broader protection community, um, and how that maybe helped you better understand protection issues, and and did it help shape um, the development and prioritization of the response and, and helping you all move forward? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so yeah, as as you mentioned, um, basically as part of the of the SGBV task force, we we met uh, as a subgroup to look at uh, how do we engage men and boys in Lebanon, which is a question that that came up regularly and that we didn't necessarily address as interagency. So we sat around the table with most of the of the stakeholders, INGOs, UN agencies that actually intended to to engage uh, men and boys and then we thought through okay what approach should we take should we um, I don't know for example implement existing program models like engaging men through accountable pra uh, practices um, that IRC had developed or other approaches and why should we approach it like that and it was about the time where, um, as you mentioned, um, you, you, you came to, to Lebanon and, and we had the practitioner roundtable. And we actually had the idea to combine both process and potentially look at um, developing a strategy about how to engage men and boys based on an analysis um, that we would all be doing together. So basically we had a couple of weeks ago a four-hour uh, discussion with, uh, as I mentioned, key stakeholders like I, uh, INGOs, local NGOs, and UN agencies um, that were working or planning to work with men and boys. And so we looked at first uh, developing a protection analysis, so discussing vulnerability threats and capacities of engaging men and boys. Uh, we were looking at specifically the issue of domestic violence and early marriage and how can we engage men and boys around these issues. Um, and then we had a discussion about developing a theory of change um, when it comes to engaging men and boys and what were the main actions needed in order to, uh, to reach this change. Um, this approach was, I think, quite interesting and um, I believe at least uh, quite successful in the way that it helped fleshing out as part of the analysis already a lot of underlying issues about why we engage men and boys in Lebanon, how to engage them, um, and also the different approaches, what is working. Uh, so for example, um, a lot of um, sharing were, were, was done around um, engaging them through religious leaders or as part of other entry points like uh, child protection or wash interventions, uh, engaging them as caregivers, for example. Um, so it was it was very interesting and we built on the approaches that we knew were working uh, already uh, and based on analysis that, that we had done together. And then uh, we the fact that we developed a theory of change, uh, which didn't take too long actually, four hours is not that long, mm -hmm. um, gave us some steering in, in our strategy. So basically what are we trying to achieve here? What is the impact that 
it is reasonable for us to expect uh, where are we going and knowing that helped us to or I hopefully uh, will help us to share to to shape a little bit uh, our strategy and our our intervention um, so we still have to look at um, contributors for each action so for that we are planning to involve other sectors representative to ensure proper mainstreaming but also make it realistic uh, in terms of funding mandate ongoing or planned program etc um, I think what we also need to, to do or what we agreed that, that we would need to do is also to look at entering accountability of the, of the strategy. So basically once we agreed on that, uh, developing uh, indicators and mechanisms to make sure that we hold on to the strategy and of course adapt it as, as it comes, as the change happens, but at least ensuring that it doesn't remain a, a document up in the air, but it's really implemented and then ensuring its sustainability. So uh, make it uh, based on the capacity of the actors, the operational space that we have to implement it, and also the involvement of the local um, stakeholders, the government, uh, to take ownership of the strategy. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It's really good to hear the progress that you, you all have made in Lebanon and really taking um, that exercise of a theory of change to help you think through your analysis um, of an issue, um, particularly engaging men and boys, which isn't the issue, but how engaging men and boys is um, an, an approach to address domestic violence. Um, and I'm wondering, through that, were you able to also um, flesh out your assumptions? And because oftentimes we do come with a lot of assumptions um, from other contexts, from you know, from our backgrounds, um, and we start to do programming um, based on those assumptions versus based on reality. So, did the exercise help you really break those assumptions down a little bit better to ensure that your steps or processes to engage men and boy boys would be more context specific? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically due to the, the limited time that we had, I mean four hours is not that long, um, we basically um, developed this theory of change and then while looking at the actions uh, in order to implement this change, we try to look at what are the assumptions necessary for each action to happen. And so basically um, each um, individual uh, around the table reflected on the action that they were suggesting and what assumptions would be needed to implement this action. However, we didn't have the opportunity to discuss it as a group. So I believe, I, I don't know, I feel that maybe the next step that will be looking at contributors and action planning and so on will help really grounding this, this, um, this theory of change and these actions that are necessary um, in reality and based on the capacity of each actor and maybe at this stage we might look revise a little bit the theory of change or, or I think mostly the, the actions and and think about what is realistic what is not uh, but at this stage it was it was very rushed let's say mm -hmm. yeah I think that's interesting and, and, it, and it, certainly it doesn't take long but it, it does take some time um, but I'm wondering do you think then you know just this exercise on theory of change um, did it help you then articulate the required actions and actors necessary to reduce risk? Um, and how might this be included as part of a larger protection strategy planning process to promote joint thinking around protection issues? Yeah, it was definitely interesting to and, and necessary to, to develop this theory of change. Um, I think, however, um, it will just remain a nice, uh, colorful <laughs> diagram if it's not linked to specific action, uh, as I mentioned, and realistic plans. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely once we developed this, uh, this theory of change, we would need to really uh, ensure that all the relevant uh, actors and stakeholders sit around the table, are consulted, and uh, including, including beneficiaries. And I think that's something that um, was happening, let's say, in parallel to that process that we did, but it might have been interesting to also involve the beneficiaries a little bit more in this process. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure how, but it would have been interesting to look at this uh, component as well. I think it definitely needs to be included within a protection strategy, definitely. Um, because it is your steering wheel, uh, it is the steering wheel of your, of your, of your strategy. Um, like, why are we, are we doing this? Why, why is such action justified? 
it is justified because that is the change that we're trying to make. And hopefully this change, uh, this, this reflection is based on an analysis of the needs and gaps, etc. But this is how we're making a sustainable change because we know that our strategy is addressing a specific change and we know what the change will be. Um, yeah, no, I think that's really, really important information because um, I do know protection strategies often does not include that as part of a workshop um, or the methodology that's used to kind of explore um, the response. So that's helpful information for us. Um, I want to switch a little bit um, and turn our attention to something that has come up a couple of times in our interviews about an interesting question about whether or not a protection strategy should be public or whether it should be a document that's kept confidential. Um, and this was raised given the sensitivities that often arise when different actors are involved in the development process. So for example, a government who is clearly in violation of a human rights abuses or whether certain protection issues should be highlighted openly given the security risks that organization could encounter. What's your thought about this? Um, how do we develop a protection strategy that's not watered down? Because um, we, we do see that sometimes. Um, but how does a protection strategy genuinely describe the pathways needed to address the protection issue if it's public um, versus if, is, if it's a, a confidential information um, document? Yeah, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, well, I think Regarding the the in, like the involvement, let's say, of, of the government, and, and which is linked to your question about whether it should be public or not, I think when we're talking about the protection strategy, we are aiming at addressing risks that emerge because of a humanitarian crisis that can be caused or not by the government. And regardless, the government will uh, remain the primary duty bearers of ensuring the safety of its population, host or, or displaced. Um, so in this way, um, the government inter intervention in the implementation of a comprehensive strategy um, cannot be avoided. So the government should be involved in a way or another. Um, that being said, in Lebanon, um, if I take the example of Lebanon, um, prior to the, to the Lebanese crisis uh, response plan, there was very limited involvement of the, of the government, mostly because of their own willingness to get involved, let's say. Um, and since then, uh, there was we, we have seen a much, much uh, larger involvement, um, which is a little bit a double-edged sword, because at the same time, uh, they are taking ownership of the response and they have been involved in uh, take trying to take over some of the, for example, psychosocial support. Caroline, I think we just lost you. Hello? Oh, can you there hear you me? are. Sorry. I now hear you. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's Sorry. okay. Um, yeah, so, so basically, um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, basically it was, it was uh, at the same time a, a good thing in terms of ownership, but then uh, it also um, exposed us to, um, um, to having our objectives not only not always in line with the, with them, uh, which was uh, a little bit more um, problematic, um, and um, yeah, so so sometimes it resulted in having to adapt the sector plan um, due to their involvement, um, and so I think we really need to look at having a subtle balance uh, between how much we want to involve them and what are the key steps in, in, in involving them and in making this, this, um, this strategy public. Um, and I think in order to define that, we need to look at several factors before being able to, to say whether to involve them or not, uh, or how much to involve them, how much the, the strategy should be public. Uh, first, of course, their genuine willingness to be involved, and then the risks and the benefits of involving them. Um, how much would the evidence-based strategy uh, be hindered if we involve them? Uh, who should be involved, uh, how to involve them, etc. And I think once we define a little bit more these uh, answers, which could vary depending on the context or another, then we would be able to know whether to make it widely public or um, to limit it a little bit or to present some of the aspects of the strategy or involve them at certain uh, steps of the strategies and not others or on certain components and not others, etc. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And it's almost coming from it as, um, I mean, I guess when you say we, we should decide, are you referring to then um, the interagency actors, so the actors that come around the table um, at a working group? Um, and if the government is already involved in that, then how do those discussions happen? Um, or is this something that, you know, involves, you know, you and actors um, at another level discussing what some of those barriers and um, and factors may be, um, or is it also NGOs, INGOs also having those types of discussions? So I, I guess I'm asking a little bit in terms of the we. <laughs> <If that> <laughs> Yeah, uh, so so I think also the we depends on the on the context. Um, so as you mentioned, is the government sitting around the table at the at the working group uh, or not? And then what type of um, mechanisms do you have? Or like, do you have, for example, core groups where um, the the government is not sitting around the table? Do you have INGO forums where um, where the government is not sitting around the table? Um, and where you can actually trigger this discussion, put in some recommendation to the HCT, to the um, the chairs of the of the task force, etc. So I guess the we depends also on the situation, <laughs> and it's not always that easy to to identify. Um, but yeah, if if I think about Lebanon, we have the opportunities to discuss this and to know how much um, how much each of us should be involved. So. Um, yeah. Did you find um, some similar experiences in some other contexts that you might have worked in um, where this might have been an issue as well in terms of what um, pieces of a protection strategy were included or not included in a strategy? Sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Um, I was just asking whether or not you have seen this in other contexts. I know you've worked in um, DRC in Ethiopia, and I'm just wondering if um, perhaps in those contexts or even other areas that you've worked where you see this might be something that we should also be thinking through a little bit in terms of whether it's a public or, or a, a confidential type of a document in order to ensure that key mm. issues of protection are, are included in a strategy. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I worked in Ethiopia, which uh, even talking about human rights was uh, sensitive, so even less, or protection for that matter. So definitely, if you cannot talk about protection or human rights, you cannot talk about the protection strategy. And um, in this way, I think it's very, the, the involvement of the government in developing the strategy will be very limited. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think it should be and non-existent and actually in Ethiopia we did involve the government we did work with them on strengthening their system etc uh, and in this way they had to endorse this part of the strategy uh, and they had to make it their own because they would be the one carrying out this um, intervention so I think again it has to be a very um, the right balance uh, based on an assessment on how much um, they need to be involved and what are the risks and benefits of involving them yeah um, just looking at the time, I want to make sure we have enough time um, for questions for our participants. I just wanted to kind of wrap up with one last question, um, which is one that we ask um, all of our guest speakers. Um, in terms of how do you know a protection strategy has been successful? So what are the measures you're using or the indicators to let you know whether or not there has been success? Well, if you have a theory of change, I would say your protection strategy is successful when the change happened or started to happen. Um, and how do you know whether it happens? Then you know by, by being able to measure this change. Uh, how do you measure this change? Um, through ensuring that you define indicators uh, that can highlight this change. Um, and of course, these indicators, when we're talking about sector plans, should be really developed through uh, interagency and should really uh, have addressed all the details about how do we collect this data, how do we, who and how do we analyze this data, um, what is the frequency of collection, etc. Um, and that should be agreed upon prior to the implementation of the strategy. Um, and I think this comes with some challenges in terms of, so I mentioned data analysis in terms of resources and capacity, etc., but also defining indicators that reflect the change. Um, so when we're talking about impact or outcome level indicators, it can be challenging to really define an indicator that is both uh, 
uh, measuring the change and that we're able to actually measure and it's not something that is unrealistic to um, to set for ourselves. Um, and then another challenge I guess is also what available tools do we have to measure this change. Um, so the tools need to of course meet the minimum standards so in terms of data collection and analysis I talked about GBV um, so if we're talking about uh, looking at uh, trends uh, when it comes to GBV, it has to um, really be respectful of the minimum standards in terms of confidentiality, etc. Uh, but even how do we measure changes in behavior and attitudes when it comes to at the interagency level? Um, I think this is something that is also very challenging and that we are struggling to do because, of course, there is no, no set uh, agreed upon tools at the interagency level and developing these tools and, and collecting this information, analyzing this information uh, takes time and resources and we don't often have that. Um, so I think we know when it's successful when we have all these tools and, and, and um, resources to, to prove it but often we don't uh, and that's I think an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, that's some really good points. Well, thank you so much, Caroline, for having this discussion with us. I do want to give a thank chance you. to um, our participants online to see if there are any questions from anybody. Um, and feel free to go ahead and write your question um, up in the blank. And Eileen, sorry, I didn't introduce Eileen before. Mm -hmm. Eileen McCarthy is our program coordinator for results-based protection, and she's uh, kind of streaming this and looking through the questions. So do we have any? Uh, yeah, we have one question from a participant. Um, so she would like to learn more about protection mainstreaming strategies in a refugee setup. Um, so you mentioned a bit how you include protection mainstreaming in your strategy development. So maybe you could speak a bit more to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And that's really important because I think often when we're talking about developing a protection strategy, we really uh, talk about having the protection actors sitting around the table with their protection programs and capacities and resources and develop this strategy and that's not what is going to result in a protection outcome if you don't involve the other sectors. Um, so definitely protection mainstreaming in this way is extremely important. Um, I think for us, at least in DRC Lebanon, uh, what we did is to involve the representative of the other sector, so our other um, national coordinators in our the development of our protection strategies looking at um, for example in terms of camp management uh, what can be done to to reach um, the, the change that we had set for ourselves in terms of protection outcome and what specific actions they have to and then like divide the roles and responsibilities amongst us. I find that a uh, a very useful tool to implement this protection mainstreaming um, within your strategy is action planning within the different sectors. So ensuring that each sector has their um, a set of action or prerequisite that they have to take into account when developing their own strategies or, or grants or etc. Great. Do we have any others? Um, we have one more. So you mentioned the need to engage beneficiaries to inform priorities within a strategy. What steps might we take to ensure the voices of different populations are represented? Hmm. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, and definitely in Lebanon something that is very useful. Um, we, are, we work in a context where we have um, over one, uh, 1 1.2 million uh, refugees uh, officially and a population of about 4 million uh, Lebanese. Uh, so definitely involving both Lebanese Syrian when you're talking about GBV prevention and response strategies involving also men and boys, different stakeholders, religious leaders, community leaders, etc. is really important. I think how um, and at which stage is something that we at least in Lebanon, have not necessarily uh, thought through or addressed it in a systematic way. 
Um, when it comes to us within DRC Lebanon, what we do is ensuring that through our protection monitoring, through our safety audits, we have regular focus group discussion with um, um, different um, key groups, so like key stakeholders, uh, of course groups of women, girls. Uh, we even have adapted tools for um, receiving the feedback of children as well about our strategy, our approach and, and their priorities. Um, and then um, ensuring that you're also um, adapting your um, messages and your and your um, your tools to to the different um, audience that you're, you're talking to. So if you're talking also about local actors, uh, authorities, uh, governmental authorities, being able to to also receive their feedback, but and uh, in a way that um, that can inform your your strategy. Great. Um, we have one more question. So what are the m and &E challenges in documenting the GBV program in Lebanon? Hmm. Um, the m and &E challenges in documenting GBV program. Um, I think when it comes to, um, to GBV programs, um, most of the challenges are linked to ensuring confidentiality. Uh, more specifically when it comes to GBV, I'm not going to talk about general um, issues. Um, so ensuring that the way you're going to collect the information, uh, especially when it's for um, monitoring and evaluation purposes, of course is confidential, is anonymous, um, is based on the consent of, um, the, of the beneficiaries, of the, of the women and girls, of the survivors, um, and is respectful of, of the process. So for example, um, when we are trying to receive um, feedback about our case management, we are doing so at the end of our case management process. So only when we have um, when we have reached the, the the end of the process and not during the process, in order not to disrupt the the the, the, the case management process. Um, so we also we always make sure that it's survivor centered, and we would refrain from doing so if it would affect the process at all. Um, so I think these are the main considerations when it comes to GBV programs. Um, in DRC Lebanon, um, most of the challenges we face when it comes to monitoring and evaluation of our GBV program are, are um, I guess, mostly linked to um, to that analysis again. So, but it's it's quite. I think standard, so we had developed more um, qualitative tools, so um, pre and post survey questionnaires of the beneficiaries that have access to our safe space and our structured psychosocial support um, curriculum, and um, it's sometimes a little bit challenging to analyze the information that is coming out of these qualitative tools without having the necessary resources. So I would say that, but that's not specific to GV programs, it's more of a, of a general M&E um, challenge. Great, thanks so much, Caroline. Thank you. Just looking at the time, um, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap up, um, just because I know we want to stick to this time. So I just wanted to let, before we completely say goodbye, um, just want to let everybody know how you can still be involved um, in helping us shape the discussion to really understand what's needed um, for a protection strategy to ensure that it's a results-based approach to protection. So I'll just turn it to, over to Eileen and she can um, tell you a little bit more about how you can get involved. Yeah, so we have an ongoing online discussion forum that will last until June 12th. Um, and we have some great questions there from some of our speakers so far. Um, so you can register online at our results-based protection online platform. Um, once you create a profile, I can add you to the group and you'll be um, sent a message on how to engage in the discussion. Um, also, for future events and activities and pro, uh, things going on with the results-based protection, you can sign up for updates on our homepage there, um, and then you can get those messages straight to your inbox. We also have one more webinar in our webinar series here, and this will take place next Thursday um, with Louise O'Bonne from the Global Protection Cluster. Okay. Um, and then just before we close, um, I do like to ask um, our guest, speaker, Caroline, um, if you have a question you'd like to pose to our participants, something to challenge them to think about a little bit further that we could take into our online discussion forum um, that you feel like 
that we haven't addressed quite well yet, um, but something that maybe some participants out there um, have some thoughts on. So do you have any last kind of thoughts yourself or a question that you could pose to everybody? Mm -hmm. um, I think I have one, or at least this is a question that I am asking myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it might be uh, interesting for me to hear about what is the opinion of, of others about that. Um, I find the idea of result-based protection uh, strategy development, etc., uh, very interesting and needed. And this is something that, as a humanitarian actor, um, as I feel that it would give me uh, a little bit more rationale about why we're doing this, how we're doing this, what is the change we're trying to make. So, however, I think in some contexts, especially when you're talking about emergency context, um, how feasible is it to go through all these steps and how feasible is it to have the right people around the table and spend time to, to discuss about this after gathering the right information and consulted with the right people. So I'm, what I'm trying to, to say is that um, I would like to know how much do you think uh, the development of a result-based protection strategy is feasible in a humanitarian context? And maybe what are the biggest challenges that you foresee and how would you suggest to address them? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and I do hope we have um, folks on our online discussion forum where we have quite a few signed up that can perhaps provide some thoughts about this. Um, and it's certainly the challenge that we face daily with our own program on results-based protection. So um, thank you for that question. Um, and just thank you in general, Caroline, for engaging with us um, today and in, in the past with lots of different areas. Um, we really appreciate your input and thoughts around results-based protection and protection strategies. Um, so just like to say thank you. And then thank you, everyone, also for participating today. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.